Following her coronation, Cersei shows Jaime a giant map of Westeros and discusses the multiple foes they now face. While Cersei has dreams of ushering in a long dynasty, Jaime reminds her that they are losing the war, and with all their children dead, there is no Lannister line to inherit the Iron Throne. When Jaime asks Cersei about Tommen, she responds angrily that he betrayed them by committing suicide. Cersei adds that they are the only living Lannisters who count. Jaime tells her that they need allies and reports that House Frey has been exterminated. Cersei angrily reminds him that she has been listening to their father's counsel for the past 40 years and has learnt some things. They later meet with Euron Greyjoy to discuss a possible alliance. Though Cersei declines his offer of marriage, Euron graciously departs, promising to return with a gift that will win her heart. Later, Cersei gives a speech urging several nobles from the Reach, including Lord Randall Tarly, to reaffirm their allegiance to the Iron Throne and not follow House Tyrell in supporting Daenerys. Cersei warns that the Targaryens Dothraki and unsullied hordes would pillage their lands and homes, and rape their women. When Lord Tarly points out that Daenerys has three dragons, Kyburn replies that he is, at work on a solution. Later, Kyburn leads Cersei to the dragon skulls beneath the Red Keep. He tells Cersei that his spies have reported that one of Daenerys' dragons was wounded by a spear at Marine, showing that the dragons are not invincible. Kyburn then displays a ballista and reassures her that they can hurt dragons. Cersei tests the ballista on the nearby skull of Beleriand the Black Dread, the dragon of Aegon the Conqueror, and is pleased when the bolt pierces through the massive, hard skull. Euron returns to the capital with Ilaria and Tyene Sand, the women who poisoned her daughter Marcella. In recognition of Euron's gesture of good faith, Cersei agrees to Euron's marriage proposal, though only after the war is won, and names him commander of the Iron Throne's naval forces. She is cheered by the attendants in the throne room following her success, propagandizing her defense as being compromised of the sons and daughters of Westeros. Cersei has Alaria and Tyene both chained and gagged in one of the black cells. She tells Alaria that even though they are enemies, she understands her captive's fury. She calls to mind how skillful a fighter Oberon was up to the point when he got killed, taunting Alaria by insinuating Oberon brought his own death upon himself by taunting Gregor instead of just leaving him to die. She then reveals her own grief at losing her only daughter, and walks over to Tyene, complimenting her beauty before ungagging her and kissing her full on the lips with the very same poison that Alaria used on Marcella. Kyburn puts the gag back on Tyene and gives Cersei the antidote. Cersei tells Ilaria that she intends to keep her alive to watch Tyene die and rot in the cell, even if they have to force feed her. She then expresses her delight by intimately engaging with Jaime, after which she announces that, as queen, she doesn't care if servants know of their incest. Then, Bernadette arrives, differing from the subject of Jaime, telling Cersei that Tycho Nestorus of the Iron Bank of Bravos has arrived. Following this she forms an alliance with Tycho, hoping that she will gain a loan after Jaime has successfully taken Highgarden. Tycho agrees to this possibility, as Daenerys has cost them many shares in wealth, due to her ending of slavery in Slaver's Bay. After the sack of Highgarden, Cersei meets with Tycho, who is pleased that Cersei will use the captured gold to pay off the Iron Throne's massive debts to the bank, and he engages in open flattery by saying that she is as cunning at military strategy as her father Tywin was, if not more so. Now that the Lannisters' old debts will be mostly paid off, and the Iron Bank's faith in them somewhat reassured by their recent military victories, Cersei wants to take out new loans to strengthen her position in the war, so she can finish securing control over the rest of the continent. They discuss that Cersei wants to use the money to hire foreign sellsword companies to bolster the depleted Lannister military ranks. Specifically, she reveals that she has had Kyburn make overtures to hire the best and largest private mercenary army in all of the free cities, the Golden Company. Tycho assures her that the Iron Bank will be delighted to help her with these future endeavors, once it receives the gold she is bringing them. Jaime returns to King's Landing to inform Cersei of the defeat in the Battle of the Gold Road. He flatly insists that the Lannisters have no chance of defeating Daenerys. Even if Cersei were able to buy enough mercenaries to replace their huge losses, Kyburn's scorpion did little more than anger Drogon, and neither the Lannister soldiers nor any mercenaries will be able to match the huge horde of Dothraki, who Jaime notes killed their men as if it was sport to them, not war. Cersei snidely asks Jaime if they are expected to surrender to a queen whose throne Cersei occupies and whose father Jaime betrayed and murdered, mockingly remarking that Tyrion could intercede for them with Daenerys. 
Jamie reveals to Cersei that Tyrion is innocent of Joffrey's murder, telling her Olena Tyrell confessed to it. Cersei is dismissive, so Jamie talks her through it, asking her rhetorically if Olena would prefer Marjorie to marry the strong-willed and sadistic Joffrey or the emotionally pliable and good-natured Tommen. Effectively, Olena would have become the true ruler of the Seven Kingdoms behind the scenes, in the same way that their father Tywin Lannister became the true ruler of Westeros through his grandsons. Feeling cheated of yet another vengeance, Cersei can barely contain her fury as she laments listening to Jaime, saying Olena ought to have died screaming. Jaime then points out that such vengeance is pointless, with House Tyrell now being extinct, as well as their isolation from anybody else of significance. Cersei then surmises to say that she will fight to the bitter end rather than surrender. Later, at the Red Keep, Kyburn is visiting Cersei when Jaime enters her chambers. Jaime tells Cersei that he met with Tyrion. When Cersei asks if Daenerys wants to negotiate a surrender, Jaime tells her that Danny is seeking an armistice due to the threat posed by the Army of the Dead. Cersei knows that Bronn secretly organized the meeting between Tyrion and Jaime. Cersei says that perhaps an alliance with Daenerys may be a wiser move, but she still retains her determination to destroy any force that stands against her. She also asks if Jaime plans to punish Bronn for arranging the clandestine meeting with Tyrion. She also reveals that she is pregnant with another of Jaime's children, one who she believes will someday be the heir to the Iron Throne. After reflecting on their late father's advice that, the lion does not concern himself with the opinions of the sheep, Cersei hugs Jaime and whispers in his ear that he is never to betray her again. As the Dragon Pit Summit comes into fruition, Kyburn tells Cersei from her chambers that Daenerys's forces are en route to the Dragon Pit. Cersei then warns Gregor that if anything should go wrong, he should kill Daenerys first, followed by Jon and then Tyrion, following then in any order she sees fit, before departing herself. At the Dragon Pit, the various factions meet. Cersei, Jaime, Kyburn and Euron representing the Iron Throne, Jon, Davos and Brienne representing the North, and Daenerys Court. When Cersei demands to know where her rival is, the Dragon Queen makes a suitably dramatic entrance on Drogon's back, with Rhaegal flying overhead. Euron tries to posture, threatening to kill Yara unless Theon yields to him and deriding Tyrion's dwarfism. When Tyrion and Theon retort to his taunts with their own, Euron remarks that Tyrion would have been killed at birth in the Iron Islands. A furious Jaime orders Euron to sit down, and when he disregards the warning, Cersei reiterates it. A subdued Euron returns to his seat. Getting the meeting on track, Tyrion, Daenerys, and Jon try to warn Cersei of the greater threat coming for them all, but she dismisses it as a ploy to trick her into lowering her defenses. To prove their claims, Sandor returns with the crate containing the white, which is worryingly silent. Sandor gets the crate open, but there is still no movement. He finally gives the crate a massive kick which prompts the enraged white to launch itself out and charge toward the nearest target, Cersei, appropriately enough. Visibly horrified, the Lannister Queen and her allies recoil in horror as Sandor pulls the white back on a chain, its claws inches from Cersei's face, and manages to slice the creature in half when it turns to attack him. The assembled look on in shock as the white's upper half still moves around. Jon steps forward and picks up the white's discarded hand, using a torch provided by Davos to demonstrate how fire can be used to stop them. He then uses a dragon glass dagger to the heart to end the white's upper half, bluntly stating that if they don't win the coming war, such a fate awaits every person in Westeros. A horror-struck Jaime asks how many whites are coming, and Daenerys tells him the army of the dead numbers at least 100,000. Euron asks if the whites can swim. When Jon responds, no. Euron announces to Cersei his intention to withdraw the Iron Fleet back to the Iron Isles. He declares that he has been over the whole world and has never been terrified until now. On his way out, he tells Daenerys to retreat to her island while he returns to his own, and to come find him when they are the only two left alive. Seemingly convinced, Cersei immediately offers terms. Satisfied that Daenerys is concerned with the army of the dead, Cersei will not withdraw her troops but will guarantee that they will not hinder the Targaryen or Northern forces in any way during the battle against the White Walkers. She refuses to deal with Daenerys at all, however, and calls on Jon Snow, as King in the North and Ned Stark's son, to keep the truce and to stay out of any future conflict between Cersei and Daenerys. Jon, however, says that he cannot serve two queens, and reveals to all assembled that he has already declared for Daenerys, 
infuriating all three Lannisters present. Declaring that there will be no truce if it is just she and Daenerys, Cersei storms out, content to let the Starks and Targaryens battle the undead alone and then deal with whomever emerges victorious from that conflict. Tyrion later enters Cersei's office, and the two trade savage barbs. Although she finally acknowledges that Tyrion did not kill Joffrey, Cersei blames his murder of Tywin for the series of events that led to her younger children's deaths and the destruction of House Lannister's future. Tyrion maintains that he loved Marcella and Tommen almost as much as Cersei and that he regrets what happened to them. He attempts to call Cersei's bluff, claiming that if Cersei genuinely blamed him for the deaths, then Gregor should just kill him right then and there. A tense moment passes in which Cersei does not give the order. Relieved, Tyrion heads straight for the wine. They continue the discussion until Tyrion realizes that Cersei is pregnant. All three Lannisters then return to the dragon pit. Cersei has agreed to work with Daenerys, but not by keeping her troops back. The Lannister army will march north to fight alongside the Starks and Targaryens. After the enemy delegation has left, an eager and relieved Jaime meets with his commanders to discuss the logistics of moving the army north. Cersei enters the map room and asks what he is doing. Dismissing the commanders, she tells Jaime he really is the stupidest Lannister. Shocked, Jaime listens as Cersei explains that Euron has not abandoned her, but has gone to Essos to ferry the Golden Company back to Westeros. She intentionally leaked her pregnancy to Tyrion so he would believe her, and now she intends to allow their enemies to exhaust themselves against the army of the dead, then have the Golden Company mop up the remnants of whoever is left in the north conveniently forgetting that if the dead win, their numbers will increase even more. Jaime is furious that his sister and Euron plotted this behind his back, but Cersei angrily accuses him of plotting with Tyrion in favor of her enemies. Reeling from the accusation, Jaime incredulously reminds her that whoever wins the conflict in the north will turn their attention south afterwards, either the White Walkers will march south to kill them, or the Starks and Targaryens will come seeking revenge over the fact Cersei betrayed and left them, and essentially all of Westeros, to die, but Cersei is indifferent. Finally seeing his sister for the manipulative, untrustworthy, power-mad narcissist she truly is, Jaime disgustedly declares that he, at least, will fight to honor the pledge he made. When he tries to leave, he finds his way blocked by Sir Gregor. Cersei furiously insists that she will kill him as a traitor if he tries to leave, but Jaime calls her bluff and storms out, and Cersei does not give the order, unable to kill the only man she ever loved. As she watches Jaime leave, both betrayed and saddened, snow begins to fall on her city, showing that winter has finally reached the south. 